Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Teddy Peck. Teddy is the head of business development for New Business North America for ICIS. He's another Brit stealing lots of American jobs. And what we're going to talk about today is the reality of being an effective manager. We're going to talk about context. We're going to talk about the pressure that you feel. We're going to talk about your role, the journey getting there, what you should look for when you're trying to promote people into management, but also within your own team. Succession. What are the consequences of making a bad hire? You know, fundamentally, I believe that recruitment is the number one job that any manager has. If they recruit well, then 95% of the management problems that are created downstream by hiring badly disappear. And then you can focus on the real job, which is developing people. So we're going to be in a conversation that is deliberately intended to make you uncomfortable, a trip into the ugly mirror, if you like. So buckle up. Teddy, welcome. Hello there. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Well, um, would you mind just giving us a quick history of your background, please, and how you ended up in the role that you're in? I had a fortunate upbringing. My dad worked incredibly hard from a less fortunate upbringing. He worked in sales for 40 years, lived in Germany and set up their um, Germany operations for a company back in the late 80s, which meant that at a nice time going to schools and things and ultimately embarrassingly i didn't really do much in the way of jobs so i went off to university and i did music i didn't know what i wanted to do when i grew up as it were i was still waiting until i grew up uh, left university googled jobs progression all the sort of generic stuff and recruitment and sales came up obviously because they're always going to be hiring so i started a sales recruitment company which was absolutely the best thing for me and brutal, absolutely brutal, but really needed what they gave me. I then, after 18 months, was just really bad at it. Uh, so, <laughs> so I left and I went to a, a company who my dad introduced me to a recruiter who was recruiting for a company called Acuity. I joined there in 2016 and I moved after four years to the US with Acuity. I spent a year over here during COVID, and then moved into my first management role with Acuity. Uh, a couple of structural changes meant that wasn't available anymore. And then so I moved to a sister business about two years ago called ICIS, where I run the new business team. So that's a bit about me. Lovely. Okay. So first question then, how did you know you wanted to become a manager? Well, it depends at what age you'd ask me that question. So if you asked me that question when I was 21, 22, 23, 25, and probably 26, I'd have told you, if I was being honest, the truth was I really wanted to have some control and power over people. I'm the youngest of four boys. I'm the smallest of four boys. I'm the youngest looking by a long way of four boys. That was a chip on the shoulder I never knew I had. And You're calling your brothers haggard and worn, aren't you? Big and older looking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I never really knew that that it was a chip on my shoulder until probably until you and I started working together. But if you ask me after that point, why I wanted to do it is we spent about seven months in coaching to try and make me actually a good salesperson. And the bit I loved most was was the accountability groups I set up with a bunch of other people, helping coach them, train them, understanding how you would do your coaching. And, and I just got way more enjoyment out of other people improving than I did over the actual selling side of things. Those are two different answers, and I'm glad that I ended with the second rather than <laughs> So tell me this. At any point in your sales career, mm. did you feel like you'd been let down by your management? Mm. I think, yeah, in some ways. I wish I'd got more coaching. It's one of the things I've always wished. I, I, I think, bluntly, a lot of companies just, they, I don't think they prioritize it. And there can be a number of reasons. I don't really blame many of my managers for that. But, you know, if you've got to be in spreadsheets for a lot of the day because someone needs a report, it must be hard to find the time. If you've got eight, nine, ten people you're managing, it must be hard to find the time. I was dedicating a lot of hours to coaching in my first role because we didn't have any kind of cool recording software. So every day after 
after like five till six, there would be coaching sessions I'd run for the team, not compulsory, but I would be there every day. That was quite hard. But then I moved to the company I'm at now where we have a cool recording software and um, that makes it a lot easier. So I, I think in some ways, yes, I feel like I probably could have got more from people. And at the same time, my responsibility is to find it if I'm not getting it from from my boss at that time anyway. Let, let me ask you this very direct question then. Why aren't you a better manager yet? I failed to find someone who is dedicated to coaching managers, really. Apart from you, and when we did that, like there aren't that many people out there that don't focus on selling to a CRO, CXO, mm -hmm. or direct to the salesperson. And, and a lot of people miss the, the frontline managers. So one of the reasons I'm not good enough is I failed to find someone. The second reason is because I'm same as selling. I, I kept, I'm lazy at points. I cut corners sometimes. And uh, sometimes I forget the reason why I'm doing the job is not about what I want to do. And so there's, there's a couple of things, you know. It's interesting because what I see very often is people with the best will in the world trying to be customer centric. But then what they do is they violate some fundamental. So all of a sudden, they, for some reason, their attention gets drawn to making the sale they feel pressure to put pressure on the customer. And we'll see this a lot in the market that we're moving into as the recession hits, because the US has had a, quite a soft landing so far, but I think that's going to get a lot tougher. And interestingly enough, immigration has been part of the, uh, the soft landing mm -hmm. uh, because that's taken some of the, uh, the shock out of the system. But what you'll see is that people will become more manipulative. They'll make empty promises. They'll become dishonest. They'll violate the seller code. You know, mm -hmm. They'll become seller-centric. They'll fail to listen. Can I give you an example of that? One of the guys in my team is, is off to a great start this year. He's worked very hard during the time that we've been working together, and it seems to be clicking, which is good. He's about, and I think he finished Q1 at 200% of target. Which is which is nice, it's good for him. But it was funny because there was something that would have got me over or closer or on target for for that. And and I asked him, I said, you know, do you think there's any way that you could that could work? And he comes back to me with exactly the way that I would expect, which is like, before I answer that, what's the reason you're asking me? Which is obviously, I'm like, okay. I said, just ignore me, ignore me. And anyway, in our next one to one, I said to him. I want, want to just be clear that I'm going to do everything I can to put zero pressure on you moving things faster or slower or whatever. I'm going to do everything I can. And I want to know that if I at any point say something that doesn't seem in tune with what I'm saying right now, you have to call me out there because I'm, I said to him, because, because I'm also, you know, there's also pressure. My point to him was you won't be feeling it as much as others might. And I might, and I just want you to know you can tell me to bugger off, basically, because it's important. It's, it's hard to always keep that front of mind. Okay, so that speaks volumes that you trust the person you're talking about, and you're willing to be vulnerable. You're putting the interests of the customer and the interests of your team member before your own. But what you've done is you've created an adult-to-adult -adult contract instead of a parent to child contract mm -hmm. where you have equal stature in the partnership but different roles and yes you are ultimately accountable for the number of the team he is ultimately accountable for his number mm -hmm. and everyone knows that that is the job to be done from the seller's perspective but it is a symptom of doing the other stuff well would you mind telling the story about the, the recent win yeah about doing stuff well, yeah. A lot, yeah. I mean, I'd like to think that, that that one situation there, I'd like to think is one of the very few in the past two years that I've ever made, a, like I've made a mistake in that way on results thinking. But a lot of what we do is focused on, you know, if you think about what is their life like, are we the best for them? If we're not the best for them, what should we do? A great example from a, a story from one of my team the other day. He is about 12 months into working here. And he was working directly with a CEO organization focuses on their contracts being two years out. 
And what they looked to us um, to help them do was to predict the changes in prices for certain commodities that impact how those contracts will land. What my, the guy in my team did very nicely was on the second call with the CEO, it was essentially, you know, we had the first call, we understood, second call, you're going to make a decision one way or the other, is that fair? But before he got to that, at the beginning of the call, the guy in my team basically said, look, I've been really thinking about something you said, and I'm concerned that we might not be right for you. And I'm concerned because you said your contracts are two years out, our forecast only goes 12 to 18 months out, and I'm... I'm worried that you're not going to get the return in 12 months because we don't cover that additional few months. Like, what, what's going on? Are you sure you're okay? And the CEO turned around and said, firstly, thank you very much for doing that. I had a bad experience where someone said they could do something. Then when we paid them, they said they couldn't. And I have no fear over that. That's my decision to make. I think it makes perfect sense to move forward. If you could send me the contract, we'd be happy to sign up. Top man. Lovely. Yeah, it's very good from him. Very good. And well, again, the fact that that is possible in the culture of your team, because uh, I know having coached many people, that if that ever got back to a manager that they'd said something like that, they'd probably be on a pit in many cases. Mm. Uh, that you didn't. That for you, that is best practice. So I, I'm very curious. What sort of autonomy did you have to give up when you took the role of manager? There's no point doing it for them. So I've had it so much so that my team are like, look, I need you to tell me what you think I should know because I don't know it. Rather than like, because I'll have them try and work it out for themselves, ask some questions on, you know, what, what do you think the feeling was from the prospect at this point based on this thing? Can you pinpoint where you could change something? And eventually they'll just be like, look, I'm kind of getting a bit sick of this. Can you just show me what you mean? So the autonomy you give up, I think, was just like, I no longer have actual control over what question happens next. And, you know, like if, if I think it should go one way, I don't have control over that being the case. And that means that maybe an opportunity here or there might not move as quick, might not be as large, might not close, you know, some variation or a meeting we could have got on a cold call doesn't convert to a meeting, you know, whatever it might be. And, and that is difficult when you see things. But when I, I mean, you'd help me a lot when I thought about it. So, like, well, the things that I can actually control is how much coaching and training do I give to the team so that they know that this is what I expect. This is what should be done. This is how it should be done. And then once they they understand that process and they're dedicated to that process, it then becomes a slight variation because it's them that it's doing the process, not me. So it, it was really hard to get to to give some of that up. And sometimes, you know, I, I'll be honest, I might listen to a call and sort of sit there with fury on my face and my girlfriend will walk past and be like, what is wrong? And, <laughs> you know, but not as much as perhaps I used to. So. Yeah, that, that was difficult. Tell me this then. You have to, from what you've said, you, you've moved from a parent to child dynamic to an adult to adult. And um, it, it strikes me that the temptation to rescue is very, very high. And God knows I've, you know, I've fallen into the trap many times. <laughs> um, and I think we have to try to think as the other human being as a manager, a seller, a coach, and understand, as they do, how they feel, what they hear, how they interpret it. And you can't possibly do that without a really high degree of empathy. To do it well, and you said, you know, you spent a year listening, really deep listening, understanding the intimacies of the context in which your people have to sell, their customers operate, and the application of really powerful, provocative questions like the one that uh, your team member asked, because mm. well, that was a really powerful question. It was deeply personal. It caused the individual to betray either their current position or their future position and drop their defenses, and it created tension, which then in its own way Disperse the tension. That's the beauty yeah. of taking that approach. 
what's the other way of like i think about like what's what's the other way of doing it they find out that it wasn't right and you never said anything or they say like th there's no bad outcome in that scenario in terms of the relationship i'm going to use that word loosely between the seller and the the buyer now a bad outcome might be actually he finds out that the risk the ceo might say that the risk i took wasn't the right one but at no point does he turn around and go and that salesperson didn't tell me i should consider what i didn't consider you know what i'm seeing you present there is the role of being an ally mm -hmm. not being an accomplice where you're Co creating a codependency and you're not uh, encouraging them to carry on in their uh, current way in order to further your own ends above or before their uh, before theirs mm -hmm. and you're not being an adversary because you're not coming in you're not trying to break things you're not trying to disrupt things you're trying to meet them where they are and align their interests with the company's interests and then manage that way so how do you maintain the patience and how do you prepare for those moments mentally practically i think my job is to i don't know if this is the right word but my job is to embody what their job is in front of them like they should in front of their customers or prospects so if they come to me with a problem you know they need to have two ways they try to fix that problem you know, some evidence, something like that. You did three, I did two, I didn't have the heart. That that was one one part of it. But like if so if I ask them tough questions, or if I label some of the emotions they might be feeling to help them kind of come to terms with what's going on, then they will see that that is the way I behave with them, which is the way that they should behave with 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 their prospects, which is why I was so disappointed in myself in the first story that I said that I ever that I got it wrong. Because I just it's the shit. It's a shit thing to do. But what it means is I, I think that the patience becomes less about patience. It becomes more just like it, it's always you're always coaching. So I don't really feel like I'm having to wait that much because I don't think I'm that patient as a person. But I might be wrong. Again, by the sounds of things, you're doing stuff incrementally. So you're constantly moving them forward. And in the process of doing that, oh, uh, let me rephrase that. I think what you're doing is you're empowering them to move forward and take ownership. And that's all part of that process of creating an adult to adult relationship, which in the sale is critical as well. Mm -hmm. The seller has to create an alliance with the buyer. And in practice, what they need to do is ensure their brain is perceived as zero risk to the buyer's brain mm -hmm. um, and you have to create the conditions where there is alignment and allyship so you are both working towards the customer's intended better future outcome what they want and what's also really interesting and i've realized that of late is that if you spend your time trying to diagnose through pain it's counterproductive. So I'm really curious when you're doing uh, your coaching with your people, do you take them to pain or do you have them focus on the outcome that they're trying to create? So sometimes I will use a level of pain to, to kind of start that conversation if needed. For most of the stuff we do, I think it's been established why we're doing it kind of early and we understand what the outcomes are meant to be and for those that are more dedicated to those outcomes they believe it a lot more so if i give you an example i do coaching every day pretty much with my team uh, it's not compulsory but i yep. think people still think it is compulsory but it isn't my point is we'll do cold calling practice for a couple of weeks we'll do reversing for a couple of weeks we'll do like super specific, like five, maybe five minute sections of calls that the team that I've noticed have. And when we approach those, sometimes I might be like, look, I'm kind of getting, I'm getting the sense from people that are starting to be a little frustrated that the meetings aren't moving from first meeting to second meeting. And I, I'm starting to feel that people are kind of opening up opportunities, but they're getting really annoyed 
that those opportunities quickly close through being ghosted. And so, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's kind of been sort of maybe feeling a bit like that recently or from off base and everyone, you know, someone will pipe up and go, yeah, kind of had a few of those recently. So, okay. So I journey into that and say, so what I want to look at now is how we can avoid those. So if we were going to understand, and so that's about as much with but, my team that I need I to. Understood. So that, that you're not doing the pain discovery. You're using that as the starting point from X to Y, and you focus them on the Y part and how you create that app. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So again, why would we not employ exactly the same principle in the sale? Do not believe that the buyer already knows what their pain is to a large extent. Mm -hmm. They know they know what the symptoms are. They don't need to know what the causes are. What they do need to be clear about is what they are trying to accomplish because they rent the solution, they rent the outcome. So in the same way that when your people admit that they have that issue, okay, so how do we create a solution to that? They're starting to look immediately at towards that better future. And my hypothesis is really simple. Have the customer focus on the solution and have them paint that picture. Because I don't think you need to do pain discovery in the sales process. I think it's redundant. And actually, if you look at the effect on the brain, the neuroscience tells us that reminding someone of their most painful or their most recent pain is probably not a great thing because there's something called the pratfall effect. And most sellers are not adept at not leaving the buyer in pain when they do pain discovery. But then we have to look at the intent. What is the reason why people do pain discovery? Why do sellers do it? For a bit of contention, I don't agree 100% on everything. everything. I think that pain is important for both parties to understand and at least establish because without that, we might not actually be the best people to serve you because they may believe, like, it's like, I think with companies, certainly with ours, more and more seems to be from inbound opportunities coming in or inbound conversations. It's like, you need to quickly understand for both parties, I don't know, <laughs> like just time and effort they're going to put in if it's the right effort to put in and i think a lot of the time for us is to establish if there is actually a big enough problem which comes down to some level of pain but dragging them kicking and screaming through it when they don't need to be dragged is a complete disaster so if it's almost like if someone is turning up ready to buy the buy it let's talk about what they're going to get from doing that not so when you sat down right mm -hmm. and you thought about everything that this was costing you and how shit your life is tell me about how shit your life is five minutes after meeting me like I, I can see how that one is it, it's a dangerous dangerous path but i think great salespeople do get the balance right and i think you know why do lots of salespeople do pain discovery because that's what is expected but the problem is is that the training is not reinforced consistently enough to get them to be good at it and so it just feels like they're like asking you the standard questions everyone's asking to try and find a problem and it's weaponized um and yeah, the is the real the issue treatment. the real issue is that it's about the seller trying to control the sale and the buyer mm -hmm. it's got nothing to do so think about a bant question or a medic question how does that in any way meet these six criteria? Being timely, relevant, and personally valuable, help the individual get clarity on their reality, understand what is possible and possible for them, and advance them towards making the best decision for themselves. Identify a single bant or medic question that satisfies all six of those conditions. I should have humble read at the moment. Yeah, um, you should. I'm not seeing how how they do. I think, look, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say they're not valuable. Ban, I don't really agree with. There's extensions of that medic and, and other things that, honestly, I'm not 100% in the weeds of what they do. I think they're great, great tools to be used in exercise, but not to be used as, like you say, as weapons or reasons to do something else. Like, so if you're, you know, like how unbearable is it when you speak to a salesperson? person or you know or i did it where it's like how much budget have you got 
allocated? How much budget have you got? It's just like, what? It's, it's just a completely pointless question. It doesn't really get you anywhere. And you can, you know, the funny thing is, it's like, the funny thing is that it, it completely ruins great work you've done before. One bad question can flip you up real bad. <laughs> It's not American TV. You can say, yeah, yeah, it will fuck you up pretty bad. Like it just, it's amazing. And it's because I think, and I try and say this to my team, I'm like, look, I I think what we do as a job can be a great profession and you can be a professional salesperson, just like you can be a professional lawyer. You know, I'm sure there are unprofessional lawyers, but everyone is looking for a reason to, to brand you as what they think you are, which is a prick. Who's there to grab their money so it's hard it's really hard and one or two bad questions bad comments can sway someone just like that don't give them evidence that you fit the stereotype yeah and i've learned just don't give an opinion unless it's on a podcast that's that's, <laughs> often, that's, often, <laughs> that's often hell <laughs> well okay so i mean this is fascinating Let, let's just dig a little bit deeper into um the role of the manager um because I think there are some evergreen skills that whatever you do in life are critical. And these are really good listening skills, the ability to truly empathize, not this sort of weaponized bonding and rapport shit, to ask very, very powerful, provocative questions that cause the... My favorite type of questions have three qualities. The first is they are deeply personal. The second is they cause the recipient to betray a position or someone or something. And thirdly, they create tension. So a fabulous question. My pal Antonio gave me this one. Did he hire them this way or did he make them this way, Teddy? Oof. Yeah, what a lovely question. And oh, what are you doing to prepare for what's to come? Mm. Yeah, I mean, these questions are really powerful because you can't gain them and you can't give a shitty basic response that most salespeople do. And I think our challenge is to help people remove the scales from their eyes and see what's possible for themselves. So we empower them. And that's the job of a salesperson, but that's the job of a manager, too. Mm. And I'm curious which of those competencies you brought across and which ones didn't transfer well from being an individual contributor. I don't think I was a great listener for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. (laughs) The reason I'm saying that is for anyone that's made it this far, which is probably very few, you can learn pretty much everything. I also was really not empathetic in any way. And I had to learn it through the help. Bad for this. So yeah, through the help of some very good friends and from Marcus and others. So you can learn these skills, and I did. And I, which ones did I bring through? I think I did bring through a really good ability to actually get people to tell me what they think, to actually listen to them, to actually dive into to it. And that came from two things. Two two major people or peoples that I work with. One was you, Marcus, and the second one was Alan and Alan Sang and Dan Oblinger. And yeah. the reason I mentioned those two is everyone now would have heard of the word like the term labeling, yeah. labeling emotions through the brilliant book Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. What an unbelievable marketeer he is. Yeah. And he's obviously very good at it. But what Dan and Alan do, who were trained by the same guy. Is they yeah, take Gary Mesner. So yeah. if anyone wants to, there's a very early episode about three, four years ago with me and Gary. He was the guy who um, was in charge of the Waco uh, disaster. So Yeah, which is also a good documentary to watch. And he's on there. But what they do is they take you just a little further behind how they are meant to be used and what needs to underpin all of those. And so I think that the reason that I didn't just read the book and start doing it and the reason that people here will have experiences where it works sometimes and where it doesn't and when some of people have done it to them and they hate it is because there's absolutely no intent underlying the reason that they're doing it. Yeah. And so I think... It's a I tactic, think, it's a weapon. And it's very obvious. Um, so I think that those were two... I think I really did a good job with people when I started managing them of, of understanding actually what was going on, where their hesitations were, where 
good questions. I don't know. If, I think I do fine. I, th like, I think I do fine. I think a uh, good question comes in and one I'd add for yours, which is the uh, a good one to do once you've established what someone should do and they didn't multiple times is the assumptive when you you know, when you sat down and you prepared for those four objections, we said are the only four objections that we ever got, and then you got one of the objections, and then you role played it. What happened when you were in the meeting and did that? It's like, well, I didn't do any of the first steps. It's like, okay, so when we spoke about this yeah. three months ago, and it was like, what what have I misunderstood about what we were trying to achieve in the next three months that still led us to the same place? Like that assumptive question is kind of annoying to hear, and you have to be very delicate with it. To build on that, you have to operate from the winner's triangle. Mm -hmm. So you have to be vulnerable, you have to be nurturing and caring and empathetic, and you have to be assertive. And th this is where a lot of people misunderstand the idea of creating, democratizing and creating adult-to-adult -adult agreements, because what they tend to do is resort back to command and control, where they try and impose KPIs. And the challenge there is that what we need to get is individuals to make a commitment, a promise to one another. Mm -hmm. This is what I promise to you. And you then have the right to hold my feet to the fire. But very often people say, well, hang on a second. We're meant to be um, all uh, equal and democratic. And now you're uh, pushing back. Yeah, you made a bloody promise. If you don't keep it, I absolutely have the right in our partnership, which in which we both have sovereignty and we are allies for the long term, then we have an obligation to hold each other to account mm -hmm. or hold ourselves to account and be responsible to one another. Yeah. That's perfectly legit. And I think people in management, early management roles, very often are afraid to move into conflict because they don't understand how to have constructive conflict. Mm -hmm. So again, I think in the recruitment process, this is a really important part of yeah. the cycle in my book, which is to be very, very clear and very early on in the recruitment process, establish the, uh, the guide rails to make sure that constructive conflict and speaking truth to power and having a voice are part of the agreement. So when you are recruiting, I'm really curious about your process because the your process that you did on LinkedIn, I thought was just masterful. Wasn't it your idea? Okay, I'll take the spread, <laughs> but you you did no, but you did it way better. Yeah, but, I think uh, the building blocks were mine, but you're. Sorry, actually, I'm, 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 just I'm, being, I'm being an ass. I'm being an ass. I think when you're recruiting salespeople, you need to look for. What do you need those salespeople to do when they work for you? Can you get them to do it before they work for you? So the thing that, that you're referencing there is no one really knows what my company very well. No one knows who I am. And so no one knows. I haven't got some big reputation or a book where people feel like I want to come and work for you. But this is what I'm working on. These are the things that I can give to you. Um, and I guarantee that you will get from me during that time that you work for me. These are the things that I expect from you. If if you've read this far, here is my mobile number. Cold call me and talk to me about whether you think you can help me with these problems. And the good thing about that is two people called me, which means I know that I've got two candidates that aren't willing to actually call me. Now, you know, you've taken into account that no one knows me. I don't work for Google and this and that and the other. But it was a good way of me understanding, you know, who to call. And lo and behold, one of them got hired and is super. So that in, in recruiting, that was good. One of the things also that I found to be seriously important, I'll do one interview, I'll pass them to my boss for a quick thumbs up, and then I'll ask them to give a short presentation or in any way they choose back to me of the problems that they believe they have found that I have that they think they can fix. And in the first interview, what I do is I will be super, super clear on exactly how they will get this job because I want to test whether they're listening. I'll tell them, these are the things that I'm looking to discuss with you. These are the things I really care about. These are the aspects I believe make a great salesperson. 
at the end of the half an hour of us talking, we're then going to go and do a role play. And I will have asked them prior to that point, send me your current company, who you sell to, the problems you fix, company size, and I will be really uncomfortable because I will be one of your prospects. You will be yourself, so you can't mess it up. But the point is, is that people still don't perform at a level that you would be comfortable with. And I think that's important. But you tell them everything you're looking for. Unfortunately, people don't listen and they won't hear it and they won't ask questions. They won't do that. But that tells me a lot about the person I'm interviewing, which is important. So look for all the things you want them to be before they hire, before you hire them. Now, how different is that to the cloak and dagger process where you don't really know what the hell you're doing, what to expect? If you're completely transparent with people, then their perceived risk drops. Mm -hmm. If they are not transparent back and reciprocate in the same way, you're going to pick up on it pretty quickly because inauthenticity is quite easy to spot mm. for most of us. And if you've made it into a sales management role, you know, some uh, level of uh, self-awareness and contextual awareness is pretty key. So in terms of the recruitment design of candidates, let's talk about that because I think this is an area that I see most managers fail on miserably because they cut and paste the same job description of the person they just fired, let go or left. In that time, the world has changed. Many of the job descriptions I'm seeing out there weren't ever brilliant, but they were fit for the purpose in a different economic cycle. We're now in a very different market, certainly over in Europe, and things are a lot tougher. It's closer to 2008 than 2018. Mm. So how do you go about designing your candidates? What, what is it you're looking for? So, I mean, I've only hired two here and um, people don't, haven't left my team yet. So they're both here and seem happy. I, so I haven't had too much of a change. I can give you the example of two years ago in 2022, the company that I was work, I am working for had gone through some fairly big structural changes in the US in terms of people. There had been new leadership assigned. There had been changes that, that the company felt were necessary. So when I joined, my role was really to take the new business function from a primarily inbound kind of focus function to something more outbound focused, which I arrogantly thought would take me no time at all. But what that meant was the people that I would look to hire, hadn't. I did not care one bit about their previous experience. My main focus was they had worked at smaller companies where they were in a pure outbound based role to begin with. So I would not want people from, if you look at ICIS has a thousand plus people, company that owns this has 5,000 and the company that owns that, our big parent company is FTSE 10, 35, 50,000 people around the world. You know, I don't want people from a Reuters, a Bloomberg. I, I just thought that for the team's mentality, the best thing we could do is get someone that is used to picking up a phone every day and no one knows your company name, no one knows your brand, no one knows what you do. You might be in a new market, all that stuff. So I, I created job specs specifically to target people like that. And for our internal recruitment team, for any recruitment I was doing of bench building candidates, was all focused on, on LinkedIn, on like 50 people companies, 100 people companies, absolute max. The second thing I did was to stop hiring people like me. In my, my best efforts was I worked with, and I should probably doesn't even remember, but Lee Ashton that you know, yeah. was really kind. I reached out to her because I'd heard her on a podcast, maybe one of yours, saying that she helps people redesign job specifications, job descriptions that would appeal to people I think she was specifically saying females because I wanted to get a more diverse team. I, at least I just wanted to not appeal to people like me if I could. So those were two things that I did back then. I think if I was going to hire someone now, I'd really have to spend some time thinking about what differences I'd need, what different aspects I'd need. I'd probably steal a bunch of your ideas and, and stuff like that. But it's important. you know. Well, tell me this then. Why were you looking for diversity in the team? I don't need another one of me in the team. <laughs> I'm being completely honest, I'm really, really, my history of managing people, I have only had men in my team. And 
it's a little embarrassing to admit that. In my team now, it's still all men. I have some diversity through different areas of diversity. I will ultimately hire who I think is best. And I had two people at final stage. One was a lady and one was a guy. That it wasn't a competition at that point in the difference. She, however, was superb. And I recommended her to be hired internally, which she was. And she's been working here for a year yesterday. It was her year anniversary. Lovely. Oh, in, fantastic. But we made I, two hires. <laughs> I think diversity is really important because I can't understand someone. Can I really do a good job of fully understanding and being able to empathize with people that didn't have a similar upbringing to me when I've already admitted I'm not very good at empathy? I have to really work at it. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably not. And you know what's great is they've had that if I've dated people that have come from different backgrounds or if I've become very friendly with people from different backgrounds, like when I, became, I came over here, there's lots of people I paid football with from Yorkshire. That was different. <laughs> But you get to learn way more about it. You get to learn way more. You get to develop your skills. And to be honest, I became way less of a prick when I started talking to people that weren't like me. You know, way, way more important. It's done nothing but good for me. And this is the thing that baffles me about the drive and desire to shut down um, the diverse voices. Because you get so much more done with so much less effort if we cooperate. So... When you compare um, the blood, sweat, and tears of you getting your job done and you look at managers across the board in other industries as well as your own, what's the difference in terms of the operating rhythm, the pace of work, the emphasis? Well, maybe I can take one step back and then I'll get, get to that. Yeah. So I thought a lot about what I'd like to do in the future naturally that has continued to climb the greasy pole upwards and so I've asked myself a lot of questions about like well, how would I go about hiring a sales manager how would I go would I promote someone if I didn't promote someone how would I interview someone so I'm prepped as best I can be when that happens so here are some of the things that I think that people should consider who are still somehow on listening if you're a salesperson thinking I kind of think I'd be all right at that or maybe I'd be good at that have a think about some of these questions and if you're a company just do this from a company point of view, asking about the person they might promote. Have they at any point shared any interest whatsoever about moving into management? <laughs> That's a good start. Have they, yeah, full stop, end, or well, question mark, end. Have they ever expressed any interest in coaching others? If they have, have they taken any action to coach new people that you've hired, junior people, senior people? Do they pipe up in coaching sessions? Have they done any of that when they've told you that they were really happy, that us are really focused on, on coaching? Now, once someone sat them down and explained to them all the blockers, challenges, and issues they're going to have, all the disruptors in their life, personally, probably a bit, and professionally, when they first become a manager and potentially for a little bit longer, like money impact, loss of control of outcomes, emotional conversations, responses, decision makings, all the things that you skipped when you weren't, when you're in sales, they get amplified by the multiple of your team numbers. When you make expectations clear and obvious, and then they're not clear and obvious to someone else, and they say they didn't understand and it irritates you. When you have to work out if you need to be a therapist, a mother, a father, a brother, a friend, a coach, a leader, a man. They were pretty difficult. When you told them all that, did they still want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> like, and then the final thing is, have you spent some time or have you asked them all of their true motivations behind why they really want to be a manager? Now, if you can go through all those and you're still sat here thinking this might be for me, probably the answer is it probably is for, for you. But it's it's very difficult. And so then what I, in answer to your question, I just want to say I don't have everything perfect, but I do love my job, even though it doesn't always sound like it. The operating rhythm that I focus on is there's a great podcast, Marcus, that you did with Nadia, surname I can't pronounce. I'm an F. And the title of that podcast is Manage Yourself into Redundancy. And what that means is if you coach your people enough, the time that you would have spent in spreadsheets that you could have spent coaching is time that you no longer need to spend in spreadsheets or coaching as much because the coaching, it has started to happen. So the spreadsheets you had to create to track the forecast that you were doing based on the percentage of the likelihood of Salesforce coming out so you can give it to your boss becomes less and less vital because your people know what they're doing. 
So and you can trust the forecast. Ish, yeah, with, with enough certainty that you're not in a spreadsheet for, for two hours a day, for sure. You know, and and I hope one day I can trust implicitly without. without. <laughs> so my my focus was always, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll listen to a bunch of people who do. Scott Lee said I offer coaching like two or three times for an hour every day to my team. They don't have to come, and I was like, well, that sounds pretty smart. So I did that and the results were absolutely incredible in the first job I was in. And then when I've come here, the changes in people's behaviors, the change in their performance, the change in their quality. So my operating model is nothing else takes more priority than coaching. Coaching has to be everything. Because then what you see is now I don't have to do coaching every lunch because one of my team said, I really like coaching people. Could I run one? And then I say, he does <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah. And yeah, so so I think that maybe that's a difference from what I see with others. Uh, I'm not perfect and there's lots of things I miss, but I really, I cannot stress how important coaching is. I agree. I mean, uh, I'm uh, using a a model, the 5D model, which I think I stole mostly from Mike McCallowitz at one point, but it's doing, deciding, delegating, uh, designing, Mm. developing. The the, the quadrant that you showed me, right? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, the objective is to move around the model clockwise. So if you imagine there's a a rectangle in the middle, about two inches high, six inches wide, and then quadrants coming out of it. So it looks a bit like a telescopic site. Top left is doing, top right is deciding, bottom right is delegating, bottom left designing, um, middle is developing. Now, every hour that an employee or you contributes has a value in terms mm-hmm. of contribution. Mm-hmm. And it can either be $10 an hour, $100 an hour, $1,000 an hour, or $10,000 an hour, or you can lose $10 an hour, $100 mm-hmm. an hour, $1,000 an hour, or $10,000 an hour. So you have highbrow behaviors and lowbrow behaviors. Lowbrow behaviors tend to drag you anti clockwise back into the doing and into lowbrow behaviors as you go. So instead of delegating, you abdicate. Instead of deciding, you act as a bottleneck and you try and control everything. So then you rescue, yeah? So all of these traps have a quantifiable cost. And as a coach, what you can do, as a manager, what you can do is you can look at where your team spends their time and look at the value contributed. And if you just move them, into the adjacent box clockwise, typically that's a 10x increase in value. Yeah. Now, what we want, I'm guessing, certainly as a manager I always wanted, was an easy life. I wanted (laughs) to be certain to hit my number so I could go off and do the stuff I really enjoy. And that depends on trusting my people to be able to do that on their own, which is why I hired them. So I have to get them to the point where they're able to do that without my help. And when they need my help, they ask for it. But I'm not managing by complete application because there's that regular coaching and check-in. So I always know where things are. When was the last time you did a team pipeline meeting? Uh, Why don't you do team pipeline meetings just out of curiosity? I asked my team what they thought of team meetings. And they said that they hated those bits because they didn't get them anything. So what we, there, there are clear expectations I've had that we built as a team. So I built the predominant, stru- well, most of the structure of it, most of the things because they need to know. And that was one for me. So I sat down with my boss when I first started here and I just said, what are the things I need to do? He said, okay, here's your admin stuff. Type this out. Just wrote down as many notes as I possibly find. So admin. And it basically breaks down into the doing, the stuff you don't want to do, and then like the deal cycle. And so we created all of this so that we shouldn't have to talk about pipeline reviews every Monday at 12. What we do is once a month, I meet, I only meet my team for a one-to-one once a month. Because, As a team? Uh, individually. They're scheduled one-to-one, is mm-hmm. one hour, once a month. And it follows a very clear structure of Basically, here, you know what the expectations document says. So the first part of this is tick, tick, tick. Do we do all the boring admin stuff? Yes, we did. Okay, good. Next thing is let's talk about deals. If we haven't spoken about them, which ones do we need to talk about? And then the third part is around like how are we basically moving more things into the funnel? 
and the final bits are around right that takes genuinely about 15 minutes and the next 45 minutes is just what how how else can i help you with these things and i order it like that because the how else i can help you is more than it's unpredictably long <laughs> it's that you give them the responsibility to keep their sales force up to date and tell them if you can't do it, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be the manager you don't really like, which has, I have to have this because it's part of your role. It's part of my role and it's part of my boss's role. There is no escape from that. Mm -hmm. But where there is escape is me asking you about it if, if it's just done. So how are you helping them manage their behavior within the time available so they're not working stupid long hours? evenings, weekends, and killing themselves and burning out and pissing off? Coaching. <laughs> so I, just in case anyone's questioning you, the one-to-one the one -to -one that I do once a month is the one scheduled one-to-one -to, -one to do those things. However, my team can book time with me at any point that they want between kind of like eight and six, ideally nine and five and not at lunch. But, you know, things happen, right? As long as they know what they want to get out at the end of that meeting, they know why they're turning up for it, and they they can demonstrate some effort to try and resolve something they want to get out of it. We do coaching a lot with the people that really want it. One of the guys in my team, we do an hour every single day. He's booked him, and we do an hour every day. We have done for a year. Lo and, lo and behold, he's actually pretty good uh, these days. But I will just treat them like adults, and I coach them, and I make it so they understand that these are the things that I expect. And if they're not done, then that's kind of difficult for us to work out what happens next sometimes. And, but they're almost always done. I never ask them to work on PTO. I never, uh, annual leave, I never ask them to work after hours. I even say to them when they first start, if I message you after hours, I do not expect a response until the next day. If it's so urgent, I will call you and I will call you, but there's nothing so urgent. And the same thing with like, um, I sent them an email yesterday because I'm going on in July, I'm going back to the UK for five weeks. So I sent them in the same the same way. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to be in London for two weeks. I might pop down and say hello. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely be back. And I said, to, I said to them, if there is nobody else in the company that's working that can fix this, and it's that much of an emergency that you have to call me, you can call me. Brackets, these things do not exist. <laughs> because they don't. And it's, I want them to know that that's the same thing for them, which is there is nothing so urgent on a deal that it can't wait a little bit yeah so don't don't sit there until midnight on your phone waiting and asking and that's not know. life or death yeah it, and if your pipeline's strong enough it's not going to make any difference and no one's is going to not buy from you if you yeah, manage because you didn't answer them at 11 30 at night yeah yeah exactly. or if they won't then you probably don't want them as a customer because you'll just inflict them on someone else so some good questions to lead off uh, an event or a call what degree do you intend to get value out of this call to what degree are you prepared to engage personally to achieve it to what degree are you prepared mm. to take risks to learn at this call and to what extent are you prepared to take responsibility for learning engagement of others at or after this call now that's puts the onus back where it really belongs in the same way that learning is the responsibility of the learner yeah no one else i find that hard to be honest <laughs> like it, it pains me to i feel a lot like i don't do a good enough job when i see people making the same mistakes teddy let's wrap up now if you had your time again and you had an opportunity to speak to someone who knew what they were doing what do you wish they had told you other than coaching that would have made a significant difference and possibly for you not to have to live with the regrets of those bad decisions. Yeah, well, I've got a long list that I can walk <laughs> you through here. Uh, <laughs> but when it, when it comes to like being a sales manager and moving in, these are the two things that I felt like I really got. The sales methodology of the company I was working for and a bit of coaching on that and a little bit of coaching on how to coach. What I didn't get that I wish I had found out I probably should have worked on is, you ready for this? Mm -hmm. How to hire, how to onboard, feedback on coaching, how to set expectations for the team, for them, from the company, from me. How do you move someone out of the business? When, how, what do you do? What do you say? If you inherit a team, should you assess their level of 
ability based on an interview process. Is that fair? Is that not fair? If you do it, what does an interview process need to look like? If you're hiring someone else, how do you do an interview? What are the key indicators for a successful hire? What is the manager's role and when do I spot which one I should be? Am I a teller, a listener, a therapist, a guide, a director, a, a command and control, a work it out for themselves? How do I implement boundaries so it doesn't become too much like a friendship? There's a few more. How to avoid burnout, negotiations internally. How do you manage those going up and going down? How to spot a complaint versus a problem? When to fix it and when not to fix it? How to react in light of conflict? How to run a team meeting? What you do with the CRM? Strategy for your total addressable market and your ICP identification. How do you work with other apartments? Approvals for stuff like holidays or expenses. Uh, and how do you know whether you're doing the right thing with travel and expenses? And if you go out for team meals, um, that was what I thought people should really need to think about. <laughs> uh, and I'll say it again. I love what I do. And I loved working out that I didn't know that stuff. But I really think we can do a better job of helping the next level, next round of managers coming through, get ahead in those areas rather than try and catch up. So final question then. I fundamentally believe that selling is a leadership role. And the functions of management need to be to create heroes from your team. Mm -hmm. um, ego is just a disaster. I see it getting in the way of so many things. What would you suggest people do in order to establish a high degree of self-awareness, which is not only being aware of how you feel, but your impact on others and how they respond to you? Because I think as a manager and as a seller, these are really vital skills. Mm. So different people would be different, have different ways. A good suggestion, if you really don't know, is to journal. I'll be honest, that's not something that I've found I've needed as much. Great friends. Re I've got great, great friends that call me out for all the dumb, dumb shit I've said or do. And it took me a long time, and I'm very pleased that they stuck with me for me to learn that. And then once you kind of get, just like spend some time thinking about why you're doing what you're doing. Spend some time thinking about conversations, whatever is important to you. Just spend some time thinking about it rather than forgetting it. If you are reviewing the call, don't think about what you did. Think about how they responded just constantly. And, and those, those three or four things I think will help. Absolutely. You've really got to de develop the empathy muscle. And it's real empathy. It's not this fake weaponized. Oh, yeah. Empathy is understanding and feeling and hearing what the other person understands, feels, and hears as they understand it, as they feel it, as they hear it. Mm. That's a skill that requires you to put your ego aside and not judge. So on that final note, Teddy, thank you so much. This has been incredibly instructive. Definitely want to have you back. How can people get hold of you and are you recruiting? I'm always interested in meeting new people. I'm not actively recruiting right now. My number for people in the US and outside is plus one, three, four, seven, two, six, zero, zero, eight, nine, eight. If you want to talk about what it's like to work for me, if you want to talk about your plans for moving into management and how I might be able to help you come and get over some of the stuff that I said, give me a call. If you're too afraid to give me a call, you can message me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Right. Teddy Peck, thank you. Thank you. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you're looking for a coach who will empower you to become the manager you want to be without compromising your values, without having to coerce or manipulate or bully your people, and you've been the victim of that and you don't want to do it to someone else, then drop me a line. I'll send you my management audit. And it will help you to identify whether or not you have an aptitude for management. And if you do, then where you can grow building on your strengths. So drop me a line. In the meantime, stay safe. Happy selling. Bye-bye.